temporary insanity, repeated Lucio again, as if speaking to himself. All remorse, despair, outraged honor, wasted love, together with the scientific modern theory of reasonable nothingness, life a nothing, God a nothing. When these drive the distracted human unit to make of himself also a nothing, temporary insanity covers up his plunge into the infinite with an untruthful pleasantness. However, after all, it is, as Shakespeare says, a mad world. I made no answer. I was too overcome by my own miserable sensations. I walked along, almost unconscious of movement, and as I st stared bewilderedly up at the stars, they danced before my sight like fireflies whirling in a mist of miasma. Presently, a faint hope occurred to me. Perhaps, I said, he has not really killed himself. It may only be an attempt. He was a capital shot, returned Lucio composedly. That was his one quality. He has no principles, but he was a good marksman. I cannot imagine him missing aim. It is horrible. An hour ago alive. And now, I tell you, Lucio, it is horrible. What is death? It is not half so horrible as life lived wrongly, he responded with a gravity that impressed me in spite of my emotion and excitement. Believe me, the mental sickness and confusion of a willfully degraded existence are worse torture than are the contained in those uh, uh, than are worse okay the mental sickness and confusion of a willfully degraded existence are worse tortures than are contained in the priestly notions of hell come come geoffrey you take this matter too much to heart you are not to blame if linton was given himself the happy dispatch it is really the best thing he could do he was of no use to anybody, and he was well out of it. It is positively weak of you to attach importance to such a trifle. You are only at the beginning of your career. Well, I hope that my career will not lead me into any more tragedies as the one enacted tonight, I said passionately. If it does, it will be entirely against my will. Lucio looked at me curiously. Nothing can happen to you against your will, he replied. I suppose you wish to imply that I am to blame for introducing you to the club? My good fellow, you need not have gone there unless you had chosen to do so. I did not bind and drag you there. You are upset and unnerved. Come to my room and take a glass of wine. You will feel more of a man afterwards. We had by this time reached the hotel, and I went with him passively. With equal passiveness, I drank what he gave me and stood, glass in hand, watching him with a kind of morbid fascination as he threw off his fur-lined overcoat and confronted me, his pale, handsome face strangely set and stern, and his dark eyes glittering like cold steel. That last stake of Linton's, to you, I said, faltering, his soul, which he did not believe in, and which you do not believe in, returned Lucio, regarding me fixedly. Why do you now seem to tremble at a mere sentimental idea? If fantastic notions such as God, the soul, and the devil were real facts, there would perhaps be cause for trembling. But being only the brain-sick imaginations of superstitious mankind, there is nothing in them to awaken the slightest anxiety or fear. But you, I began, you said you believe in the soul. I? I am brain-sick. And he, am I am I? I am brain-sick? And he laughed bitterly. Have you not found out that? found that out yet much learning hath driven me mad my friend science hath led me into such deep wells of dark discovery that it is no wonder if my senses were some sometimes real and i believe at such insane moments in the soul i sighed heavily i think i will go to bed i answered i'm tired out and absolutely miserable alas poor millionaire said Ju lucio gently I'm sorry, I assure you, that the evening has ended so disastrously. So am I, I returned despondently. Imagine it, he went on, dreamily regarding me. If my beliefs, my crack-brained theories, were worth anything, which they are not, I could claim the only positive existing part of our late acquaintance's Viscount Linton. But where and how to send my account with him? If I were Satan now, I forced a faint smile. You would have cause to rejoice, I said. He moved two paces towards me and laid his hands gently on my shoulders. No, Geoffrey, and his rich voice had a strange soft music in it. No, my friend, if I were Satan, 
I should probably lament, for every lost soul would, nece would of necessity remind me of my own fall, my own despair, and set another bar between myself and heaven. Remember, the very devil was an angel once. His eyes smiled, and yet I could have sworn there were tears in them. I wrung his hand hard, and I felt that notwithstanding his assumed coldness and cynicism, the fate of young Linton had affected him profoundly. My liking for him gained new fervor from this impression, and I went to bed more at ease with myself and things in general. During the few minutes I spent undressing, I became even able to con contemplate the tragedy of the evening with less regret and greater calmness, for it was certainly no use worrying over the irrevocable. And, after all, what interest had the Viscount's life for me? None. I began to ridicule myself for my own weakness and disinterested emotion, and presently, being thoroughly fatigued, fell sound asleep. Towards morning, however, perhaps about four or five o'clock, I woke suddenly as though touched by an invisible hand. I was shivering violently, and my body was bathed in a cold perspiration. In the otherwise dark room, there was something strangely luminous, like a cloud of white smoke or fire. I started up, rubbing my eyes, and star stared before me for a moment, doubting the evidence of my own sentences. For plainly visible and substantially distinct, at, the, at a distance of perhaps five paces from my bed, stood three figures, muffled in dark garments and closely hooded. So solemnly inert they were, so heavily did they, their sables' draperies fall about them, that it was impossible to tell whether they were men or women. But what paralyzed me with amazement and terror was the strange light that played around and above them, the spectral, wandering, chill radiance that illuminated them like rays of faint, wintry moon. I strove to cry out, but my tongue refused to obey me, and my voice was strangled in my throat. The three remained absolutely motionless, and, again, I rubbed my eyes, wondering if this were a dream or some hideous optical delusion. Trembling in every limb, I stretched my hands towards the bell, intending to ring violently for assistance, when a voice, low and thrilling with intense anguish, caused me to shrink back, appalled, and my, f my arm fell nervous nervously at my side. Misery! The word struck the air with a harsh, harsh, reproachful clang, and I nearly swooned with the horror of it, for now one of the figures moved, and a face gleamed out from beneath its hooded wrappings, a face white as whitest marble, and fixed with such an expression of dreadful despair as froze my blood. Then came a deep sigh that was more like a death groan, and again the word, misery, shuddered upon the silence. Mad with fear, and scarcely knowing what I did, I sprang from the bed and began desperately to advance upon these fantastic masqueraders, determined to seize them and demand what meaning this practical and untimely jest, when suddenly all three lifted their heads, heads and turned their faces on me, such faces, indescribably awful in their pallid agony, and a whisper more ghastly than a shriek penetrated the very fibers of my consciousness. Misery! With a furious bound, I flung myself upon them. My hands struck empty space. Yet there, distinct as ever, they stood glowering down upon me, while my fists, clenched fists beat impotently through and beyond their seemingly corporeal shapes. And then, all at once, I became aware of their eyes, eyes that watched me piteously, steadfastly, and disdainfully, eyes that, like witch-fires, seemed to slowly burn terrific meanings into my very flesh and spirit. Convulsed and almost frantic with the strain on my nerves, I abandoned myself to despair. This awful sight meant death, I thought. My last hour had surely come. Then I saw the lips of one of those dreadful faces move. Some superhuman instinct in me leaped to life. In some strange way, I thought I, thought I knew or guessed the horror of what next the next utterance would be, and with all my remaining force I cried out, No, no, not that internal doom, not yet. Fighting the vacant air, I strove to beat back those intangible weird shapes that loomed above me, withering up, um, withering up my soul with a fixed stare of their angry eyes, and with choking call for help, I fell, as it were, into a pit of darkness, where I lay merci mercifully unconscious. That is end of chapter 9 of The Sorrows of Satan.